Bye. Okay, let me welcome everyone here today to today's Cold War Studies seminar. We are going to be speaking today about a book that uh, is just about to come out. It hasn't come out yet. You'll see in the background, this is an image of the cover of the book. It um, is about this, it, the title is uh, the Soviet Union and, um, and European Cold War Neutrality and Non-Alignment. Um, and so the book focuses on neutral countries in your neutral and non-aligned countries in Europe, but doesn't just look at them as neutral and non-aligned countries, but looks at the interactions they had with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And the idea of the book is also to look at the impact that this had on the wider international system. So there are chapters looking at the role of other external powers, and then chapters looking at uh, each of the neutral non-aligned countries in some depth, and then looking at uh, particularly the Soviet Union's approach to them. And so it, it covers, uh, it's a thick book and covers quite a wide range of topics. There are 24 chapters in the book and um, it should be, I think, uh, at least for now, the definitive work on Soviet Union's interactions with neutral and non-aligned countries in Europe. The, uh, today's seminar brings together four of the contributors to that book, also the three co-editors. And let me just say the book had its origins in a conference that one of the today's speakers, Ario Mako, organized in Stockholm in September of 2015. Subsequently, he and uh, Peter Rugenthal or another of today's speakers um, went through and cajoled the contributors, as did I, um, to, uh, to revise their chapters, in some cases to rewrite them entirely. And that process then, it was fairly time consuming and laborious process, but ultimately led to the book that you see, whose cover you see in back of me here. And the, uh, we will be doing numerous events this year in connection with the book. Ideally, in the fall, we'll be able to do them in person now that Harvard yesterday announced that it will be, that it will be uh, uh, reopening on the 2nd of August. I'm very hopeful that we will do an in-person event in the fall. So today's seminar uh, brings together four of the contributors. They look at, in their particular chapters, Peter Rugenthaler, who had contributed in an earlier book to the series, um, the Harvard series, Cold War Studies series, had uh, contributed a book on the uh, Stalin's approach. In his chapter in this book, he looks at the post-Stalin period and Austria's interactions with the Soviet Union. Um, then Ario Mako looks at Sweden, um, has, has written extensively about Swedish new, uh, neutrality policy, and in his chapter here looks again at interactions with Sweden. Nadia Boyajeva is one of the authors of a uh, uh, chapter on a crucial country in the book, Yugoslavia, because Yugoslavia had been staunchly aligned with the Soviet Union and then um, ended up being thrown out of the Soviet bloc by Stalin and subsequently in the post-Stalin period maintained a position that Nadia Boyajeva will describe today where it was one of the co-founders of the non-aligned movement among other things. And then uh, I will briefly comment in my chapter, I cover sort of an overview of the book and will discuss in particular Soviet Union's conception of neutrality and non-alignment in Europe and the um, U, uh, U.S. perception as well, because those were somewhat in many ways two sides of the same coin, but uh, that is what one saw about neutrality for particular countries was something that the other viewed with alarm. One favored it, the other uh, would have um, opposed it. So let me turn first to uh, Peter Rugenthaler, who will be 
discussing um, his chapter as well as any comments he wants to offer as a, one of the co-editors as about the book as a whole. Please, Peter. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much for organizing this event. Um, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, uh, as Mark uh, already said, um, uh, my book on neutrality under Stalin came out a few years ago. Now um, the aim was uh, to focus on the post-Stalin period, um, beginning from uh, 1953, 55 onwards. Um, uh, the book. Um, um, has 24, uh, it is almost impossible, of course, uh, to go into details and uh, to tell the really fascinating uh, story of uh, neutrality and non-alignment in Cold War Europe. Um, actually, as I always uh, point out, the history of European neutrality is not only the history of uh, uh, four, in this case, four small countries, it is the history of the division of Europe. Um, it is uh, an additional perspective, um, uh, an additional approach a Cold War in Europe with, uh, in some case, really fascinating findings. Um, let me just very briefly give you a very short uh, overview on uh, more or less uh, the Soviet perspective uh, on the neutrality of uh, these countries. Um, as you know, the foreign policy of Austria, Finland and Sweden was determined um, uh, during the Cold War uh, to differing, uh, differing extents, mainly by the factor of the Soviet Union, of course. Um, uh, well, Switzerland um, Um, uh, but uh, I'll now mainly focus on the other three. Um, while Swedish neutrality was never an official political doctrine, but rather the expression of pragmatic politics since the early 19th century, Finland's and Austria's policies were product came a de facto state doctrine uh, in Austria and in Finland. Um, if uh, Finnish um, endeavors on the way to self-neutralization were shaped by the uh, attempt to minimize Soviet influence as far as possible, the Austrian neutrality of 1955 was a classic product of the Cold War. It was a compromise solution between Austria and the for of the Second World War, aiming to end the Allied occupation of Austria. Neutrality was, in the Austrian case, the price Vienna was prepared to pay in order to end the four power occupation of the country. So this is a major difference uh, to uh, self-neutralization, uh, which uh, lasted uh, more or less uh, the whole Cold War. Uh, from the Soviet point of view under Stalin, it was only the consolidation of the division of Germany and the fixing of the German dual statehood in 1952 that laid the groundwork for thinking about Austria's future in concrete terms. Um, as we now know, Soviet diplomats considered a solution comparable to the Finnish one, um, a practical, a practical hoping to safeguard with this Austrian dependence um, uh, toward the Soviet Union um, even after the conclusion of the state treaty. Even if Austrian politicians wanted to take Swiss and Swedish neutrality as a model, the Western powers would not in any case have agreed to a Finnish model. Um, the Austrian pledge to Moscow uh, a permanent neutrality after the conclusion of the state treaty in May 1955 was, as you know, honored on October 26, 
the fact that for the Soviet Union and the East Bloc, Austria now also carried the risk of, as I always called it, of a socialist Trojan horse and the strategy of the creation of a neutral zone by the Soviet Union with a subsequent Sovietization was of course registered. And as we know now, also and see it um, in the Soviet files, was um, 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 registered with ancient, ancient in, not only in the Kremlin, but also in the West, above all in Bonn. But also in Hungary, Austria's neutrality was in many circles as a model of the Austrian state treaty and the success of the movement of non-alignment countries. As uh, Chaba Bekesh, one of the authors uh, of this volume, points out in his essay, produced the illusion that some form of neutrality could be achieved even in the East Central European countries. Um, it was uh, Nikita Khrushchev um, who systematically used the neutrals as a means of propagating his policy of peaceful coexistence. It was him who repeatedly extolled Austrian and Swedish neutrality as a model above all the NATO countries um, like uh, Denmark or um, Norway to go also the Austrian or uh, Swedish way and Finland as a, something as a showcase uh, for peaceful uh, coexistence. Under Leonid Brezhnev, um, the Soviet Union continued to endeavor um, to win over the neutrals as advocates and mouthpieces for the policy of detente. Um, uh, the example of uh, the CCE process or of uh, the road to Helsinki is, is the best to give here. Um, um, the, before uh, the process uh, started in 1969, of course, the suppression of the Prague Spring in August 1968, that uh, um, uh, shortly detente, uh, Finland and Austria were shown with uh, painful clarity what being a next door neighbor of the Soviet sphere of influence meant. In actual fact, it was the lesson Austria uh, learned from the experience of 1956, Hungary, and the Prague Spring, the crackdown of the Prague Spring in 1968. But however, the process led to a steady increase in the status and weight of these both neutral countries, both Finland and Austria, a situation of bridge builder between the East and the West. Um, although Austrians were initially very um, reserved, um, Finnish uh, went ahead. Um, 1969 was uh, the Finnish president, not the Austrians. CE, um, the final act in Helsinki on the 1st August 1975. Um, let me just use the opportunity to say that this is um, currently um, our, our um, um, research task at the moment, also in cooperation with uh, uh, Stockholm University and uh, with uh, Davis Center um, on the role of the neutral states on the road uh, to Helsinki. Uh, for the time, um, with extensive uh, use of Soviet files. Um, by the end of uh, the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, the Soviet factor played a different role in the, the foreign policies of neutrals. Um, uh, this was more or less the beginning of a change. Austria was increasingly unwilling to play the interests of. Uh, the United States for its own economic interests. This was an expression of an actual policy of neutrality, similar to Sweden, in spite of a much shorter time, 
span uh, neutrality had become also an identity establishing factor in Austria, which meant more to the respective populations than a mere foreign policy course of their countries. Switzerland, on the other side, uh, respected the Kokum regime and the more traditional neutrality conception prevailed within parliament. Finland um, had been, of course, most comprehensively undermined by the Soviet Union. Uh, in contrast to Sweden, Finland and Austria were more closely aligned with the Soviet Union and its uh, East, Eastern European satellite states, above all economically and culturally, though not ideologically, of course. Um, during the Cold War, both countries were special significance to the Soviet Union, since they were the only Western countries from which Soviet Union could obtain modern high technology, as long as this was not based on US software. Um, under Gorbachev, um, of course, the situation uh, totally changed. Um, um, in the case of Finland, it was uh, more or less the irony of history that with the end of the Cold War, uh, neutrality was really um, um, accepted by the Soviet Union and Gorbachev. Um, for Austria and Sweden and Finland, it meant, of course, uh, the um, 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 uh, acceptance uh, to the European Union. Um, uh, and um, so this is um, one major part of the book. Um, um, uh, the other part of the book, besides the Soviet perception, um, deals with the perspectives of the neutrals, um, in uh, particular with regard to the transformations that took place in the detente years, but also um, uh, another part of the book um, um, uh, gives us um, new insights into Western perceptions of the neutrals and their relationships uh, with Moscow. Um, we do have uh, chapters on the United States, Great Britain, France, um, 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 uh, Western Germany. Um, so in total, um, I hope that this book is uh, next, um, if not a milestone, and then at least um, it opens a, a I hope uh, new pages um, in studying and understanding the Cold War in the um, uh, in Europe um, on the division of Europe. Um, let me with this. I, I also uh, I already want to come to an end and uh, want to thank once more the organizers, uh, the main organizer. We all three organized the conference in Stockholm three years ago. It is Ario Marco from Stockholm University, who will uh, now go more into detail with this. And um, uh, finishing, I just want to thank once more um, uh, the, the sponsors um, of the conference and of the research projects. It was specifically uh, the Weinberg Foundation in Stockholm and the Austrian Scientific Fund in Vienna, which also gives us now the possibility to go into detail and to do further research on the um, uh, important um, uh, period from 1969 to 1975. Thank you. Let me, thank you, Peter. Let me turn next to Ario Mako. I'm very glad he can be here today because he's on his way to Switzerland and is at the airport right now. But he fortunately is the timing of the flight is such that he can actually contribute today. And he was um, instrumental in the uh, whole project that led to this book. He organized, as I mentioned before, he organized a conference in Stockholm in September 2015. That was the where the germ of the idea came together about this book. And some of the papers were presented there that uh, underwent significant revision over time and then eventually came together as a book. And Ario in particular, who is a, who has written extensively about Swedish neutrality during the Cold War 
um, is going to look today at the, uh, his chapter in the book um, deals with, uh, some length with Sweden. And so he will be presenting some of that today. Please, Arya. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I've, I've experienced some instability with my connection, but I hope it'll hold for at least the next 12 to 15 minutes for join, my join the club. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, I thought I, I'll start by, by giving the background to organizing the, the um, conference in Stockholm in 2015, back then with you and, and Peter, um, because I think um, that we have a slightly different background with you coming from extensive experience from researching Russian and Eastern European archives, whereas I came from more of a, a Western uh, or Western European angle towards Cold War studies. And um, back then there was al already a backlash of the kind of uh, heavily Western influenced um, school of thought in, in, in Cold War studies and in uh, triumphalist uh, accounts uh, about the end of the Cold War um, and also questions about the accessibility of um, Eastern and in integration of Eastern European archives. Um, so to me, leaning uh, heavily on, on documents from, uh, from Western Europe, um, from Western archives, um, um, it, it simply was um, obvious that we needed to, to approach uh, the topic of neutrality also with, with greater focus uh, on the uh, Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc and on bringing Eastern and uh, Western scholars together. Um, so I do thank both you and Peter for, for making that uh, possible and also continuing uh, this line of research. Um, as for my, my chapter uh, on, on Swedish neutrality, and, and I'll be a bit broader than, than in the chapter that treats uh, mostly the uh, the 19, 1960s, but if one wants to understand the deeper roots of Swedish neutrality, um, one has uh, to go back further in, in history, of course, um, at least to um, the uh, late early modern period, Sweden, Sweden losing its status of a, um, as a major power in Europe, and also um, its uh, increasingly tense uh, relationship with Russia, um, culminating, of course, in the, in the loss of um, uh, Finland um, to, to the Russian Empire uh, and choices made in the early 19th century towards um, what was uh, called neutrality back then, staying out of, um, or trying to, to rather to, to stay out of, of major conflicts. And um, this was by the, the 20th century and uh, uh, World War I already uh, uh, part of national uh, identity. And those episodes where, where Swedish neutrality was compromised were, were usually uh, written out of uh, the national historical discourse and excluded from, from that uh, national memory. Um, but both during the World Wars and um, and during the interwar period, when Sweden was one of the earliest members of the League of Nations, um, the term neutrality was deeply um, uh, entrenched in, into Swedish national identity and um, uh, every foreign policy carried out by, by Swedish uh, foreign ministers had to be designed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, neutrality. So uh, by the... By the uh, uh, second half of the 1940s, um, it, it came as a as a natural choice to to Sweden, also facing increasing pressure uh, from from the Soviet Union, which of course, um, as we will also learn from from others today, uh, viewed uh, neutrality increasingly critical. Um, and one example of that is um, the expulsion of um, Baltic citizens in, in 1946. Um, we find this, the Swedes go back to, to um, a rather um, cautious um, way of defining neutrality and art neutrality under the um, foreign, long-term foreign minister, Esten and Diem, um, who was in office between 1945 and 1962, who had also earlier served in, 
uh, as foreign minister in the mid 1920s and and had been uh, experienced the breakdown of um, the League of Nations and the the system it represented, of course. Um, and by the time we already see um, that there um, clearly were several dimensions to Swedish uh, neutrality. Um, on the one hand, the Swedes were very um, keen on um, maintaining um, their neutral stance, not uh, making a difference between East and West, although it was obvious that uh, if there was ever, or if there was fear for an attack, uh, it was an attack from the East. Um, at the same time, we now know, or we learned after the end of the Cold War, that uh, military cooperation with, with the West, uh, secret cooperation with the West, was or reached an extent by uh, the early 1950s that had the Eisenhower administration um, uh, note that, that Sweden was a neutral on our side. Um, and it, it is still a, a matter of, of debate on um, how exactly this was designed and communicated between politicians, uh, diplomats, and, um, and the Swedish armed uh, forces. Um, Sweden is also very renowned for the turn it then made, um, adapting uh, the zeitgeist that came with decolonization and um, attempting a much more um, offensive and, and, and uh, vocal role in global politics by, by the 1960s, notably under Prime Minister uh, Olof Palme. Um, but as I wrote in actually in the, the Journal of, of Cold War Studies earlier, I think even uh, when it comes to, to the 1960s and 70s, when, when Sweden established this image also as a critic of the superpower, uh, as a mediator, um, as a provider of good offices and, and an, uh, an active player in global politics, one has to, do, to make a distinction between uh, the European and the global level. Uh, at the European level, for instance, reflected in Sweden's approach to the European Security Conference, the CSCE. Um, the Swedes acted much more cautiously, um, always maintaining or trying to maintain uh, stability in their relationship with the, with the Soviets and, and taking into account um, the, the harsh uh, realities of security policy. Whereas uh, on a global level, when criticizing the United States, when criticizing um, the Vietnam War um, and so on, there was more, um, more uh, space for them to, to be vocal and go as far as having their ambassador sent, sent home, I think in 1973 from Washington. Um, so, I, so I think that um, one, what needs to be done also for the 1970s and 80s and what I'm trying to do now um, in a more exhaustive way in an ongoing research project is to um, integrate um, the Soviet Union more into the narrative uh, about Swedish uh, uh, foreign policy and Swedish neutrality policy during the Cold War. And, um, and the main argument I think um, I would like to make, and it's, it's not only of, uh, it's not only semantic is that, that one should view Swedish neutrality as a neutrality or maybe um, that of, of uh, several of the neutrals as a, as a neutrality policy against or in response uh, to the Soviet Union rather than between East and West as, as uh, many have claimed or between the, the United States and, and the Soviet Union. I think that the role of the Soviet Union in, in the design and conduct of not only Swedish neutrality policy, but European neutrality, neutrality policy in general is it's, um, much more important than, than um, scholars have uh, realized. And I do hope that this volume contributes to, to this argument that, that me and others have been trying to make. And I, I do believe that it will become more obvious when more and more documents from the 1980s um, and, and also from the Russian archives become accessible. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. I think you're muted, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Aryo.
Um, for anyone in the audience wondering, ARIO is at an airport, which is why there are announcements in the background. Um, and I'm very grateful to him for being able to speak because uh, he's on his way to Switzerland. And so let me turn next to Nadia Buyajiva, who's a professor of international law and international relations at the Balkan Studies Institute in Sofia, and also a long-term uh, visiting scholar at the Davis Center at Harvard. And her topic will be Yugoslavia, um, which is an area of expertise of hers, um, not only the period she covers in the book, but also she has written at length about the disintegration of Yugoslavia. So please, Nadia. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, I would like uh, to thank um, the Davis Center at Harvard University and the Cold War Studies uh, for providing me with the opportunity to be a long-term visiting scholar and uh, have the opportunity to use um, the, the libraries and archives uh, uh, in Harvard. Also, I would like to extend my thanks to, to the organizers of the conference a few years ago. I was, um, uh, I had the pleasure to take part in the conference in uh, uh, Stockholm. Also, I would like, before I start my presentation, uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues um, from the Institute for Contemporary History in, uh, in uh, Serbia, in Belgrade, uh, for providing me with um, um, help and um, uh, on, the, on the spot uh, while I was uh, doing my research uh, uh, on the topic uh, being in Belgrade uh, two years ago. Uh, let me start now with a um, um, short um, presentation of my chapter. Um, I would like to say that um, my chapter covers uh, the, the long period from 1955 to 1918. And during those, uh, um, during the 35 years of Josip Broz, Broz uh, Tito rule, Yugoslavia played a more important international role than one might uh, have expected um, of a small country. From the mid 1950s on, Yugoslavia maintained a uh, conspicuous position between the Soviet Union and the West a position that uh, faded after Tito's death in 1980, uh, and especially after Yugoslavia fell into turmoil um, and to war from 1989 on. Uh, my chapter analyzes the changing relationship between Yugoslavia and the USSR from the mid 50s when the two countries partly mended the bitter rift that the Soviet leader Yosef Stalin uh, had provoked um, in um, 1948 through 1980 when Tito died. So uh, the chapter picks up um, where um, my colleague from Moscow, Andrei Edemsky, chapter leaves off. Edemsky discusses Soviet Yugoslav ties in the late um, Stalin period and the post Stalin um, rapprochement in the mid um, 1950s. My chapter examines how the bilateral relationship evolved in subsequent, uh, subsequent years from the continuous strains in the 1950s and um, 1960s to the smoother relationship in the 1970s. I'm also touching um, how Yugoslavia became one of the leaders of the newly formed non-aligned movement and how the Soviet-Yugoslav relationship was affected by the crisis within the Warsaw Pact in 1968 um, that uh, culminated in the Soviet-led um, invasion in uh, Czechoslovakia. Mm, um, in, in, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and, um, then uh, my chapter shows how Moscow's perception of Yugoslav non-alignment and the non-alignment movement evolved in the 1970s uh, when the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia overlapped on some issues uh, and developed extensive uh, trade and economic ties. Um, in discussing Soviet policy towards Yugoslavia and uh, non-alignment movement, um, the chapter also uh, perform, uh, also looks uh, at um, U.S. policy towards Yugoslavia and how 
uh, each affected Soviet perceptions and uh, policies. Um, and uh, I would like also to say a few words about uh, the conceptual framework of uh, non-alignment. Um, generally, in my chapter, um, the term non-alignment is used uh, instead of neutrality because uh, these um, two terms are either equal, but um, the terms in this case are obviously close, closely related. Um, not least uh, because the leading scholars noted have noted that the non-white uh, states shared an obligation with the neutral um, countries to remain outside the bloc structures. Um, although um, one cannot point uh, to a single date when Yugoslavia first uh, embraced non-alignment, most scholars agree that uh, the policy was a byproduct of the Soviet Yugoslav. Uh, Yugoslav um, rupture precipitated by the Yosef, by Yosef Stalin and uh, the rapprochement that followed uh, Stalin's death in uh, 1953. Um, I, I, I can, I can uh, stop here and then uh, during the discussion, uh, Mark, to discuss uh, other matters or should I say a few more words? I, I think that that should be fine for now. There are a couple of questions that have come in for you, but I'll come back to those shortly. Um, there are questions coming in from the audience that I will turn to right after I just say a few words. Um, the book, uh, Ario touched on one crucial aspect of the book is that the uh, neutral and non-aligned countries in Europe with one exception, Yugoslavia, were basically Western style democracies with free markets. And um, there, there, there were variations, of course, ranging from the quite staunchly free market uh, Switzerland to the more, ex uh, more extensive welfare states in Sweden and in Finland and in Austria. Um, and similarly, um, there was extensive Soviet interference in Finland um, in Finnish domestic politics, uh, whereas in Switzerland, say, um, not only was there no Soviet interference, but the Swiss government cracked down very harshly on communists and took, took a very staunch anti-communist line in the 1950s um, that went even beyond what was being done at that time in the United States. So the um, there were significant variations. Switzerland wasn't discussed today, but it is discussed extensively in the book for those who are interested in Swiss-Soviet relations as well as the nature of Swiss neutrality. And similarly, the book um, has chapters on uh, Hungary's attempt, as, as Peter alluded to, that um, Hungary's attempt to declare neutrality and to break away from the Warsaw Pact in um, October, November, 1956. It was a very short lived attempt because the Soviet Union sent troops in to crush it. Um, uh, the, the attempt itself though is discussed in a very interesting way by Chaba Beck as showing that um, it wasn't really the, um, it, it, it was in many ways an attempt to cope with Soviet pressure as much as an outright bid to become neutral um, and it failed uh, quite um, tragically. But, the, um, but there was a country and it is also discussed in the book that did manage to stake itself out as a, a very strange form of non-alignment, nonetheless non-alignment, which was uh, again, a communist country, Albania, which had been a founding member of the Warsaw Pact, but then starting in the early 1960s and then formally in 1968, broke away from the war, left the Warsaw Pact, and from then on pursued its own somewhat um, sui generis policy. So the, um, there were variations among the democratic neutral countries, um, but also the two communist countries that had um, positions outside the Soviet bloc, Albania and uh, Yugoslavia. <laughs> Yugoslavia, as Nadia discussed, also became one of the founding members of the non-aligned movement. Nadia covers this at some length in her chapter. So the, um, 
the variations were another thing we hoped to bring out in the book. Um, and some of these come into interesting um, perspective from the standpoint of the two superpowers, the way the Soviet Union looked on it, which is the major um, topic of the book um, versus the way the United States did. So to take a way, um, particular um, example of this would be the question of Finlandization. Finlandization was the term used in the West and in Finland, I should add, um, to describe a kind of policy that emerged in Finland, which was leaning uh, a neutrality that leaned much more toward the Soviet Union, um, by far the most um, Soviet leaning policy of the neutral countries. And that was something that the United States, the US government constantly worried about uh, would happen with Western um, Western European countries, in particular, some of the Scandinavian members of NATO, Norway or uh, Nordic members of NATO, um, uh, Norway and Denmark, in particular, who had uh, which had joined NATO in 1949. Nonetheless, there was neutralist sentiment there, so U.S. policymakers were worried that Finlandization would spread to those countries and possibly to other uh, European countries, even to countries like um, West Germany and France. So the, um, on the other hand, US policymakers welcomed Finlandization if it were applied to Eastern Europe to the Warsaw Pact countries. The, uh, the reverse was true of the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union was alarmed by the prospect that somehow uh, the relationship that they had with Warsaw Pact countries would turn into something closer to Finland. They welcomed the relation, Soviet policymakers welcomed the relationship they had with Finland, but they didn't want it to apply to Warsaw Pact countries, which were communist countries, unlike um, largely democratic Finland. So the um, and similarly, though, Soviet policymakers would have welcomed Finlandization if it had extended into Western Europe. So the, um, the perspective of the two superpowers was the reverse image, the uh, sides of the same coin. Uh, another uh, point that I just want to bring out before we turn to questions is the, quest the way that uh, NATO became one of the major um, the focal points of the way neutrality was understood. And to some extent it is even uh, to, to uh, um, today, that is um, there have been uh, countries that were neutral during the Cold War, including ones that were discussed today, Austria, Sweden, Finland, um, that uh, did join the European Union after the, after, uh, the end of the Cold War but have not become members of NATO. And the, um, they have participated in a lot of activities involving NATO, including the Partnership for Peace, but they haven't actually formally joined NATO. Similarly, Switzerland, which was not, unlike the other neutral countries, was not a member of the United Nations during the Cold War, did finally join the UN in 2002, also joined the Partnership for Peace, um, but has remained outside the European Union uh, and has remained out, certainly remained outside NATO. So there are still ways that um, countries that were neutral during the Cold War conceive of themselves, even today, as still having some element of that. And that was um, also during the Cold War was true in the way that they perceived NATO. So NATO. Uh, having established itself with 12 countries at its origin, expanding to 16 uh, by 1982 with the uh, entry of Spain, um, nonetheless still encompassed only a relatively, um, a, a, a more or less half of Europe at that point, a um, little bit more than half of Europe. But the uh, in the post, Cold War period, NATO has extended to almost all of Europe with 
the exception of the country, um, the countries I mentioned that have stayed outside NATO, the countries that were neutral during the Cold War, as, some, uh, as well as some of the very small non-aligned countries that aren't discussed at great length in the book, but are um, touched on at least briefly. Final point that I will mention here in looking at um, Soviet conceptions of neutrality is that it varied under the different leaders in the Soviet Union. So Stalin's conception of neutrality was um, very negative for the most part. Um, he distrusted it and had no real um, desire to rely on it with the partial exception of Finland because that was a kind of pro-Soviet neutrality he could deal with. Um, he had contemplated annexing much of Finland, but um, instead uh, worked out the relationship that is um, forged in the, the mutual treat, the um, mutual uh, security cooperation treaty that was established in, uh, in the early uh, Cold War period. And the, that treaty um, wa was invoked at various points during the Cold War, but that was the type of neutrality that Stalin could deal with. Everything else he was very suspicious of. By contrast, subsequent Soviet leaders, starting with Khrushchev, um, is reflected in the Austrian State Treaty, and then subsequently into the Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev era, uh, dealing with leaders like Bruno Kreisky in Austria and Olaf Palme in Sweden, became very comfortable in dealing with neutral countries, even countries that were not um, the, of the orientation that Finland was. Um, the only partial exception was that, uh, that Soviet leaders um, were always a bit wary of Switzerland, uh, as we now know for good reason. But, the, um, but still, the, uh, there worked out under subsequent Soviet leaders a kind of modus vivendi with, with the neutral countries. And that was something that was largely infeasible during the Stalin period. So Soviet perceptions, um, fluctuated over time. But uh, by the time, though, that um, Gorbachev in the late 1980s began to rethink how the Soviet Union should interact with countries in Eastern Europe, neutrality um, abruptly lost its meaning with the demise of uh, communism in Eastern Europe. And so even though Gorbachev uh, probably had he been in power earlier would have been willing to um, work out a much more extensive modus vivendi with the neutral countries. By the time he actually began to think his way through it with his conceptions of a common European home and the stance he took vis-a-vis -vis the Warsaw Pact countries, it suddenly lost its meaning as the whole political structure that had existed in Eastern Europe collapsed. So with that, let me, um, let me turn to the fair number of questions from the audience. One, one of them did deal with uh, Switzerland. Um, let me turn though, there are a couple for, let me, uh, uh, for Nadia, there is one, can you comment on the, um, the impact of uh, 19, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 on Yugoslavia? Not yet. Yeah, you're muted. You're muted. You're you're muted still. Okay. Okay. I apologize. Um. Uh, okay. So um. So what was the question exactly? What was the the, the impact of the uh, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia? <laughs> <laughs> Czechoslovakia in August 1968 on uh, Yugoslavia stands vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you for uh, for this question. Um, actually, this is a very very important question because um, the Soviet-led invasion uh, of Czechoslovakia uh, dealt a major blow to bilateral relations. And uh, before I start my answer, 
uh, because uh, I would like to to say uh, that um, uh, Ergani files, um, this is um, the files uh, that are stored in um, uh, Russian, um, Russian state archives uh, for contemporary history uh, in Moscow pertaining to Yugoslavia and the Yugoslav Soviet relations during the Prague Spring in the August 1968 um, invasion uh, are stored in the font um, 5 uh, Opus uh, 60. And here I'll stop. I won't mention the exact um, uh, numbers of Dila or collections. Uh, that a, a scholar can find there. Um, but um, I am very uh, grateful to uh, our colleagues and uh, the staff uh, of uh, Ergani Archives uh, for providing opportunity to work uh, um, in maybe last, uh, I've been working for the last 15 years there. Uh, let me answer the question now. So this is a very uh, good question and thank you for, for raising it. Um, uh, first of all, it's, it's also part of my chapter. I, I uh, touched upon this uh, question uh, explaining uh, what exactly happened and uh, explaining uh, what was the reaction from uh, Yugoslavia side and why um, we see that this kind of reaction. So Tito reacted strongly against the invasion, which was also met uh, with um, sharp criticism in various circles in Yugoslavia, uh, among state um, and party circles, as well uh, as among um, uh, large segments of the population. The invasion uh, characterized, characterized as a violent interference in the internal affairs of an independent state. Um, the, uh, something happened saying uh, the recording stopped. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what that was. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, uh, so the, re the reaction uh, in Yugoslavia uh, sparked uh, comments in Moscow and uh, essentially brought relations uh, to a post-Stalin law. That's why uh, this topic is, is very important. So. Uh, in my view, several factors uh, contribu contributed to this, uh, uh, these events. Um, those uh, factors in Yugoslavia prompted uh, this kind of reaction to the invasion in, uh, of Czechoslovakia. In particular, top officials, as well as the wider public in Yugoslavia, feared that um, Soviet military actions could easily pose um, a threat to Yugoslavia's own sovereignty. These concerns, uh, concerns were um, strengthened by uh, Soviet military maneuvers uh, along the Yugoslavia coast and uh, the presence of ships uh, from the Soviet Navy in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the Soviet Union's enunciation of the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine, proclaiming not only a right, but uh, a duty to safeguard socialism against all threats, reinforced uh, these uh, fears um, in uh, Yugoslavia um, of a threat. Um, before the Soviet invasion, Tito was welcomed, um, uh, he, sorry, uh, had welcomed the Sprague spring, uh, spring. Tito and other Yugoslav leaders uh, were among the most enthusiastic backers of uh, the Prague Spring, in part because they believed uh, the reforms in Czechoslovakia would vindicate Yugoslavia's um, own uh, notion of uh, separate roads to separate roads to so roads to socialism. Um, when Tito went, uh, let me give you a few examples. So when Tito went um, uh, to Moscow in May 1968. He emphasized um, how much Yugoslavia welcomed uh, the events in Czechoslovakia, and he tried to counter the arguments put forth by Soviet officials. Um, later on, in subsequent statements uh, in the summer of 1968, Yugoslav leaders continued to voice a strong support uh, for the um, so-called um, uh, the regeneration in. Czechoslovakia, which they argued would uh, make a great contribution to the general consolidation of the so socialist system. They spoke um, just as strongly against the tendency of many Soviet and East European officials 
to dramatize uh, certain negative uh, phenomena accompanying the transformation uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Yugoslavia stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis Czechoslovakia uh, failed to diminish uh, Soviet uh, opposition to the uh, Prague uh, Spring. Um, on the contrary, as um, newly um, declassified documents uh, in Ergani, the Russian state archive uh, for contemporary history reveal Soviet hostility to the reforms increased uh, because of a sense that Yugoslavia was trying to exploit the crisis uh, to create rifts in the world uh, communist movement. Um, Soviet analysis of Yugoslav policies throughout the crisis um, were permitted with a basic mistrust of Tito's goals in Czechoslovakia. Um, when we move further to the, the, to the fall of 1968, uh, and we see um, the, the, other, uh, the result of the other trip uh, when, uh, which Tito took, uh, Tito traveled to Prague again on a so-called working visit from 9th to 11th of August, uh, 1968. And uh, he was greeted by overflowing crowds. Um, let me say here that uh, a similar welcome was extended to, to the Romanian leader, um, Nicolae Ceausescu, uh, when he visited uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, roughly the same time on the 15th, and uh, his visit lasted from 15th to 17th of uh, August uh, 1968. So Czechoslovak leaders tried to downplay the visits, but these efforts failed uh, to diminish the extravagant public displays. Um, so the, uh, the dominant impression left from both trips of uh, Ceausescu and um, Tito uh, was the spontaneous adulation that the Czechoslovak people had displayed toward two foreign leaders who had successfully defeat, uh, de defied Moscow uh, in the past. Um, of course, the, there are um, other, other factors that contributed to this reaction, but um, um, I would uh, like to say that um, the invasion of Czechoslovakia convinced uh, him that the, the major uh, the title, that the main danger to Yugoslav security stemmed from the Soviet Union, and that the risk of an invasion of Yugoslavia could not be ruled out. And uh, in this sense, uh, the Belgrade Declaration of 1955 pledging um, uh, as I recall, is, uh, respect for the sovereignty, independence, uh, integrity, and uh, equality of states in their relations with uh, each other seem to have discarded by the Kremlin. Um, so to conclude, in other words, um, um, the invasion of Czechoslovakia this, um, gave new impetus to Yugoslavia's promotion of the non-alignment movement and brought relations uh, uh, to a post-Stalin law, unfortunately. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you, Nadia. I have a very similar questions that have come in for Ario and for Peter. Um, let me turn first to Ario, I think. Is um, that, can you comment on the impact of the Prague Spring and the Soviet invasion on uh, Swedish leaders, as well as the rise of solidarity in Poland later, uh, uh, 12 years later, and in particular, um, there were Swedish trade unions that were offering support for um, solidarity, and so both the uh, Soviet invasion in 1968 and then the martial law crackdown in Poland in December uh, 1981, how those affected the perceptions both of Swedish leaders and of the Swedish public, are you? Um, in in 1968, actually, what happened is that the invasion of Czechoslovakia sparked public debate because the leader of the Liberal Party, uh, Vidian, um, criticized the the um, what what he viewed as a as a lame response by um, um, the the Swedish government to um, 
to to the to the invasion um and that was one of the occasions where um and one of the few occasions where a controversy broke out about um the nature of swedish foreign policy and the relationship uh, to the to the superpowers um otherwise um everybody in the swedish political arena was um um or or uh, adhered to the principle of keeping um controversy about foreign policy matters um, um at, at a, a low rate and and avoid them as much as possible so we do see that that these uh, crackdowns on um, um the peoples of Eastern Europe increasingly created um, tension, even in, in neutral countries like Sweden. Um, in the 1980s, there was more of an um, established support, um, as mentioned by, by, uh, by you, Mark, um, and, and um, in the question uh, on, the, on the level of, of trade unions. And there is a fairly recent book, I think, published in 2015 by Karl Molin and um, Klaus Miskeld about the Swedish support of, of uh, Solidarność um, that uh, analyzes this support uh, in detail. But this was also during a time when um, there was um, increased uh, uh, tension between Sweden and the Soviet Union, increased paranoia over uh, allegedly Soviet submarines. Um, that is a controversy to this day, how many of these um, intrusions truly were uh, carried out by the Soviets and whether or not um, even uh, NATO um, used this to, to maintain tension between the Swedes and, um, and the Soviet Union. Um, so I, I would say in response to the question that um, we do see that um, this was maybe an, an uh, unwelcome side effect of um, establishing uh, this more active foreign policy, uh, also called the Palme uh, line or the Palme policy in the 1960s that um, uh, crackdowns on, on the peoples of, of Eastern Europe were, were seen increasingly unacceptable and uh, raised questions and sparked debate uh, in, in Sweden as well. Um, but well into the mid uh, 1980s, and, and despite the, uh, the first loss in, in over 40 years of the Social Democrats in 1976 and, and the six years uh, under um, uh, conservative uh, governments, we don't see a major shift um, in uh, Swedish neutrality policy. Um, so I think we, we shouldn't over... Um, um, Overemphasize uh, the the changes as as some have done uh, that occurred in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. Thank you, Th thank you very much, uh, Aryo. I have a similar question for you, Peter. Um, it deals with the uh, shortly after, um, just a year after uh, Austria was established as a neutral country. Um, it had to contend with. Soviet invasion of neighboring uh, uh, Hungary. And can you comment on the impact of that uh, event and the subsequent flow of refugees into Austria? And then also um, the differing experience of uh, Austria during the Prague Spring and, the, and the, in the aftermath of the Soviet invasion. Actually, it was in 1956 um, when it turned out that um, um, Austria would not serve as a model um, uh, for Eastern European countries, uh, but the opposite would be the case. Um, uh, if Khrushchev's uh, and Mikoyan's approach was uh, more or less uh, um, uh, that uh, neutrality in Austria could serve as a fertile ground for socialism uh, in the future, it was um, the opposite was the case. It was um, uh, a dangerous model, um, uh, more or less uh, as Molotov um, um, uh, feared. Um, 
1968, we had a similar situation. Um, at least uh, we do have indications from the Soviet files, uh, from Politburo discussions, um, uh, that um, 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 comrades, some comrades warned that uh, Czechoslovakia um, actually it is not a question of um, reforming uh, the communist state or re reforming socialism, communism in Czechoslovakia, but um, um, that um, uh, Czechoslovakia will turn um, into something uh, like as a first step into uh, um, Yugoslavia and uh, secondly, uh, into a model, uh, something um, similar to Austria. So more or less as a possibility um, uh, not to, yeah, to leave the Warsaw Pact and take uh, not primarily Austria as an example, but uh, the model of Austria would have been um, um, at the end of uh, such a process. So um, 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 uh, the, the main question in Moscow was, how to prevent this and how to prevent um, such outcomes. Um, um, it was really taken um, uh, into account and it was taken seriously um, uh, that this uh, Austrian model of neutrality yeah, directly at the border of the Iron Curtain um, uh, um, um, is dangerous. Um, on the one side, it was in the interest of the Soviet Union um, uh, to um, uh, it was, as I uh, always called it, uh, Austrian neutrality was Khrushchev's uh, child. Um, uh, but um, from the Soviet side, it was, of course, dangerous. 1956, uh, it um, became true uh, in 1968 also. So how could you do it? The only um, real um, approach um, um, who could guarantee that um, Austria was um, not used mostly by the Western powers as something like creating a model um, for Hungary or Czechoslovakia um, to leave the Warsaw Pact. So the only way from the Soviet Union was um, to um, establish good relations to neutral Austria, um, to create a model of uh, peaceful coexistence um, but not to create something like a model of uh, a danger um, directly at the border of uh, um, um, Czechoslovakia and, and, and Hungary in this case. Okay, very good. Thank you, okay. Peter. Yeah. Um, I'm, did you still have something, please? Yeah, I just wanted to underline once no, but um, uh, uh, these fears, um, uh, we now know some uh, from the Soviet files that these uh, fears really were taken into account into, in the Kremlin, especially you see this uh, in many um, reports of the intelligence services, but not only on the lower level on, of the intelligence services, but uh, that these uh, um, fears uh, really were discussed um, on the level of the Politburo. Very good, thank you. Um, Several of the um, several times the topic, uh, the mention of a particular archive in Moscow has come up. Rigani, let me just mention for those in the audience who are unfamiliar with it, it is an archive that holds the enormous files of the former Communist Party of the Soviet Union from the post-Stalin period. So the um, these include. Um, records of the departments of the Central Committee, the plenums of the Central Committee, uh, a lot of Politburo files. Um, so the, uh, you, the good news is, despite Putin's authoritarian crackdown in Russia, is it has not um, had a deleterious effect on Rigani. Rigani has actually improved in accessibility over the last 10 years. And so for those wondering whether you can do good research on this now in Moscow, you absolutely can. That's the basis of a lot of this project was researchers who are making use of those archives um, and uh, the files that are now accessible. So you can um, find you know, records that uh, even 10 years ago were inaccessible. They are now, you can gain access to them. 
So even though it's difficult right now to get to Russia because of the pandemic, um, presumably by the fall, researchers will um, certainly have ready access to the files we've referred to. Okay, let me turn to a couple more. One question came in about Switzerland, which let me, I'll just briefly touch on that. I think I did bring this up in my comments and maybe it's been addressed to some extent. Um, Switzerland is discussed at length in the book. Um, Switzerland, as I mentioned, was um, our, you know, it, uh, certainly internally was the most Western of all of the countries. They all were, it, with the exception of uh, Yugoslavia, they were all Western, um, even Finland in, in most respects was very much a Western parliamentary democracy. But, um, but Switzerland was the most obviously identifiable Western country. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, made no bones about tolerating communists. You know, the Swiss government cracked down very harshly on the small um, communist movement in, um, in uh, Switzerland. It also um, tracked very aggressively Soviet and Chinese spies in Switzerland. Of course, there were many of them. So they had extensive uh, counterintelligence networks designed to uproot them, or at least keep track of them. So the, um, there are many ways that Switzerland was a, a Western country, but it was also in some um, important ways, very strictly neutral. It did not, unlike the other countries, it didn't join the UN um, and did until um, you know, 19 years ago in 2002. Um, but certainly during the Cold War, it stayed out of the UN. It stayed out of a lot of other international bodies, but all, um, particularly NATO, ones that weren't seen as um, contributing to specific ends. But it, it was the host of many important international organizations that played a role in some of these, including um, the European Free Trade Association. And so the... Um, there were, there were many ways in which Switzerland was integrated, but it uh, was very strictly neutral in other ways. So it had, it's one of the um, unique cases in some ways. They, they all were unique, but, um, but Switzerland was, uh, as I use a, a chart in the book to show the way the neutral countries compared to each other. And they, Compared, um, you know, they varied over time. Ario brought up the difference between Switzerland and, say, the mid 1950s versus Switzerland in the 1970s, late 60s and 70s. And similarly, Peter under Chancellor Rob, um, the um, Austria was quite different from, say, the Austria of Bruno Kreisky. So there were variations, even uh, temporal variations, even within countries, and that was never really as much true of Switzerland. Switzerland had pretty well a consistent policy of that sort throughout the Cold War. And, um, and uh, so it's, it's, again, it has a, some unique features that are brought out in the book. Okay, there's a question about Gorbachev's common European home um, the, in which countries it envisage whether it was to bring in some of these. I can deal with this, but if one of my colleagues would prefer, please. Uh... Um, please go okay. ahead, Mark. I there mean, aren't many volunteers, so let me quickly. I think we had uh, we had a lot of conferences on this even. And, uh, yeah, to answer it's, it's, uh, let, let me just say that um, Gorbachev's conception of a common European home um, began fairly early and it, it, it evolved over time, but certainly um, in its initial conception, it wasn't all that much different from traditional Soviet um, ideas. But, th but then as events moved along and as Gorbachev's own ambitions increased, um, it became a more radical conception of reordering European security. The problem though was that it was an inequality that was emerging um, in Europe because of the upheavals that were uh, germinating in Central and Eastern Europe. 
um, particularly initially in Poland and in Hungary. And with those underway, it became harder to try to design a common European home that was truly going to be one of uh, Europe, uh, a whole Europe, um, because NATO wasn't disintegrating, but the Warsaw Pact um, slowly at first, but then very rapidly was disintegrating. Now, the idea of it, to the extent that it was well elaborated, did envisage um, bringing in neutral countries. Um, Yugoslavia's position was somewhat ambiguous because Yugoslavia was encountering problems already as early as 1988 and certainly by 1989. So the, um, that, that was somewhat ambiguous, but the others were envisaged. In fact, they were envisaged as models for the common European home that um, a Europe of Austria's and Sweden's or a Europe of um, Finland's even better um, was something that uh, resonated with Gorbachev's conception of a common European home. But it was a, a conception that was in Kuwait in many ways and uh, could never be fully developed because events overtook it. Um, so let me uh, just end with that. Okay, there is a question about, um, this is another one for Nadia with regard to the role of uh, Yugoslav relations with the United States and um, particularly in the 1970s under the Nixon administration and how those affected uh, Yugoslavia's relationship with the Soviet Union. Nadia, you're muted. Okay, I've unmuted yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I did unmute myself. Thank you. Um, well, um, the the question of uh, um, I'm dealing with um, the uh, question about Yugoslav uh, United States relations in this particular chapter uh, from the point of view how relations with the uh, uh, United States uh, somehow affected uh, Soviet Yugoslav relations. So this is my angle uh, because the, the, uh, it's a lot, there's so much reason already about uh, Yugoslav American uh, relations. Uh, uh, but I'm touching this issue from this point of view uh, in, my, in my chapter, definitely. Um, I think that uh, when we speak about uh, Soviet Yugoslav relations, uh, no matter in the early in 50s, 60s, or in, in 70s, uh, um, the, uh, we have to take into account um, um, the US policy and what were the relations betwe between Belgrade and Washington. Because um, this factor, uh, US policy and US uh, Yugoslav relations were an uh, important factor to be taking into account uh, when discussing Moscow Belgrade relations. Um, so, keeping, um, I would say that uh, keeping relatively good relations with uh, Washington was of high importance for Tito. Um, after the original split uh, with the Soviet Union in uh, 1948 and thereafter, uh, U.S. economic ties um, with uh, Yugoslavia were also important uh, for the Yugoslav economy. Um, there were active efforts um, in Yugoslav diplomatic and trade missions in, in the United States in early 70s. Uh, the embassy in Washington, uh, Washington, the five uh, consulates uh, in New York, San Francisco, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh, and um, the two uh, chambers of commerce and more than 30 offices of Yugoslav business organization. So this uh, fact, uh, this uh, data will give you a clue how uh, expanded were the relations uh, between the two countries' economic relations. So the United States ranked fourth in Yugoslav uh, foreign trade exchanges at that time. Maintaining active um, economic ties between uh, Yugoslavia and the United States was an important condition for the development of uh, good political contacts. So um, what we have in early 70s after Richard Nixon became US president, he adopted a new strategy. 
that sought a balance between Washington, Beijing, and Moscow. Nixon believed that um, diplomatic relations with Tito could serve um, um, as a bridge, kind of a bridge toward East European capitals with a different mindset and um, as a way to establish um, contacts um, with the uh, uh, so-called third world uh, states in the non-alignment movement. So these elements of the new uh, US relationship with Belgrade were reflected in uh, Nixon's visit to Belgrade uh, in October 1970 and during uh, Tito's return visit to Washington uh, in the fall of 1971. So Nixon's visit was the first official, I would I like to emphasize the first official visit of a US president to Yugoslavia. So the Yugoslav press then played, a, um, played up the event and emphasized the importance of um, having um, the leader of the world strongest uh, country visit a small country. Um, in, a, for example, in a, th th there were several meetings, so in a joint communique in the conversations from Nixon visit in uh, early October, late September, early October, 1970, 1970 Yugoslav, Yugoslav emphasized its independence and affiliation to a, a non-alignment movement Depicting, depicting it as a, a significant contribution to the peace and progress of humanity. Then Tito um, um, uh, uh, made an exchange visit uh, the, uh, to the United States uh, uh, the same year, the, uh, the next year, sorry, the, the next year, uh, late October, October, early November, 1971. Um, this was his second visit after the first one in October 1963, a few weeks after the assassination of uh, the President John Kennedy. And this visit reaffirmed, uh, during this visit, Tito reaffirmed the upward uh, trajectory of U.S. Um, uh, Yugoslav relations. Um, he gave then an interview to Yugoslav Press uh, in which he underlined Yugoslavia's desire to maintain the existing military balance in Europe. Uh, and uh, also he opposed uh, the massive withdrawal of US troops from Europe. Um, so uh, we have a, a lot of uh, information, a lot of, of course, in the, in the documents, uh, um, in the documents uh, from, um, Belgrade and documents uh, uh, from Washington, uh, different uh, from different uh, archives uh, on um, um, that on the relations between uh, U.S. and uh, Yugoslavia. Um, of course, Tito's visit to Washington brought uh, economic benefits for Yugoslavia, um, and. Uh, uh, those economic issues, uh, even those, uh, those those economic issues, they uh, they were um, the main purpose uh, of Tito's visit to the United States. He uh, used the opportunity then during those visit uh, visits uh, to raise um, his fears of the Soviet threat, and this threat from um, Moscow, according to Tito and his aides, then loomed in dangerous. Um, dangerous large uh, during the invasion of Czechoslovakia and that was likely uh, to persist. So both Tito and others in um, the Yugoslav delegation want possible hostile actions uh, by the USSR at some point in the future. Um, so uh, to conclude, um, the friendly relations between uh, Belgrade and Washington, uh, both political and economic, sparked a need in Moscow where officials, officials saw uh, the need to mend their own ties to Belgrade. So uh, there were then uh, followed exchanges or simultaneous exchanges from Brezhnev who visited uh, Belgrade, for example, in September 1971 and uh, sport economic relations between the two countries. So at that time, in the early 70s, um, Belgrade uh, had, uh, was trying to balance as usual between Was Washington and Moscow. And I think uh, it did very well. Um, Okay, good. Thank you, Nadia. Um, but P Peter, I have a question for you regarding um, Austria's role in, the, there's a question in general about CSCE, but, um, and I should add for those unfamiliar with it, it's Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, 
the process that led to the Helsinki Final Act in 1975. Um, can you comment, though, in particular on the role of Austria and other neutral countries in bringing together, um, helping to shape that, that pact? Uh, actually, um, at the beginning, uh, the role of the Austrians was very cautiously. Um, uh, the Austrians um, were asked several times um, uh, immediately um, after the crackdown of the Prague Spring, for example, the first visit of an Eastern European leader um, uh, to Vienna um, was done by uh, Dodor Zhivkov. Um, one purpose of the visit was behind the scenes to push the Austrians uh, to call for such a conference um, um, on security in Europe. Um, uh, it was not done by the Austrians, as you know. Um, um, uh, the Austrian policy, neutrality policy at that moment uh, was very cautiously. Um, um, it was also uh, under the pressure um, of um, uh, the US administration. Um, uh, the Austrians simply feared not to be the mouthpiece um, of the Soviet Union, especially um, um, so um, uh, just uh, the crackdown of the Prague Spring just uh, has happened a few weeks uh, uh, earlier. Um, so um, um, the situation changed uh, totally when the Finns called uh, for such a conference. Uh, Austrian uh, um, politicians uh, were accused <laughs> extensively by uh, Austrian uh, mass media at that time, um, uh, just uh, simply that they, but uh, this is more or less the, 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 the um, how to say, um, um, uh, the, the game of that, uh, not of that time, um, um, in, in accusing then afterwards uh, the Austrian politicians not to have used an opportunity. Um, 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 Austrians um, very actively uh, engaged in the preparation um, of um, uh, the Helsinki Accords. Um, actually, um, uh, all the details and the road to, to Helsinki um, is now um, uh, in the focus of our research interest. Uh, we are currently uh, working on such a project uh, together with uh, um, uh, Russian um, uh, institutions, the Russian Academy of Science, and especially the, the Russian archives on that. Um, 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 for this uh, period, we do have very little Soviet documents so far uh, in order to really investigate uh, the role in this case of the Austrians, uh, but also of the uh, Swedish and the uh, Finns um, at that time. What was really um, done behind the scenes, how, um, uh, how or if the Soviet Union has uh, used uh, then neutrals, especially the Austrians um, uh, in the uh, early 70s. Um, um, yeah, actually, so um, that's uh, for the moment what I can uh, say um, for, for the period until 1975. Much research is done and much is known uh, for the CCE process, um, so um, 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 Vienna uh, negotiations and uh, 70s and 80s, uh, but actually um, a real lack of sources and of research is still um, and the road to Helsinki, so the beginning uh, of the 70s. Um, much literature on that is available, of course, on the basis of Western um, um, uh, sources. Um, there are really um, um, good uh, and uh, excellent research done by also one of the authors in our uh, book by Thomas Fischer on neutral power in the CSCE. But um, unfortunately, um, Soviet sources so far has, have not been yet uh, um, available. And uh, now we try to fulfill uh, the picture. And one question by Daniel Segesa was, um, um, uh, especially regarding Switzerland, uh, one of the real uh, lacks, uh, uh, one of the gap in, in, in in research is um, 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 
related to uh, regarding uh, Swiss uh, Soviet um, um, relations, which is so far exclusively written on Western sources, and uh, very little is known is no is, uh, very little is known from uh, uh, Moscow archives. Very good, thank you, Peter. Um, we are essentially at the end of uh, our. I should add that all of the uh, speakers here today are involved in that project, that, that new project that Peter mentioned about the role of CSCE, the neutral countries in the Soviet Union. Um, that will be progressing over the next uh, couple of years. Um, there is a question which maybe I can squeeze in the last question, which deals with the non-aligned movement. Um, this is for, I guess, for Nadia, um, that uh, looking at what did, how did Tito conceive of the, since he was a co-founder of the non-aligned movement, what did he want to get out of it? Um, it didn't really have much to do with Europe. So what was he hoping to get out of it? Um, Okay, so my, my microphone is on. So what uh, he, he wanted to gain as much as he could, of course, uh, and uh, to place uh, Yugoslavia, to give Yugoslavia a special treatment, a special place, not only on the political, on the European political scene, but also uh, in terms of, uh, he went far be beyond uh, the European, um, Euro European, um, borders and uh, Europe as a whole, but uh, he wanted to, to put, uh, to, to make a special place uh, for Yugoslavia on international arena. And I think uh, in many ways he, he succeeded. Uh, uh, he, he was extremely smart and skillful and uh, he succeeded uh, um, to place Yugoslavia and to show the, the rest of the world uh, the, its strategic importance and uh, that comes from its status as an independent state uh, kept capable to facilitating uh, or impeding, impeding uh, Soviet access to the Adriatic and uh, Mediterranean as is shown uh, in uh, American um, uh, CIA archives. Uh, but um, I, I think that uh, this policy served very well to the nation, national goals uh, of uh, Yugoslavia and uh, kept Yugoslavia for a long time between, uh, gave uh, Yugoslavia a uh, very um, interesting, uh, unique position between East and uh, West. Um, um, I, I can go uh, okay. deeply. No, that's but, uh, good. Essentially, the Yugoslavia gained a lot, uh, not only uh, politically and uh, economically, uh, but also in military terms uh, from the West and from the United States. Uh, um, thanks to this uh, position between East and West, uh, Tito was able, especially after 70s, uh, to gain from both sides uh, almost equal, um, um, equal goods, uh, no matter what kind of goods provided uh, by Moscow and by Washington. And here, that, that reminds me that um, uh, even after 1968 um, invasion uh, into Slovakia and uh, um, the 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 um, Tito's uh, the Tito's uh, strong uh, uh, stand against uh, the intervention. Um, nevertheless, uh, in Moscow, uh, Moscow kept relations uh, with uh, Yugoslavia, and uh, Moscow didn't uh, stop um, uh, uh, didn't stop military supplies to Belgrade. So this is very, very important. I think that uh, having said that, uh, uh, Tito managed uh, to uh, very skillfully to uh, give the, the place uh, of a unique uh, country between East and West uh, during the Cold War. Okay, good, thank you. And, um, in, and also not only, uh, not only between East and West, but also as a, a leader, one of the leaders of uh, non alignment movement. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to have to wrap up now. Let me just say I want to thank Peter, as you could probably hear in the background at times. His son is there and is um, really rambunctious. So I'm very 
grateful that Peter was able to take part in it. And similarly, Ario, who is uh, on his way now to Switzerland, he uh, took part as long as he could at the airport. Um, but we have in-person events in the fall, um, these sorts of problems won't arise. But, um, but currently when we're relying solely on Zoom, um, that uh, in, in, they're in different time zones, um, it, it inevitably is going to happen. So I'm very glad that all four speak, uh, that uh, my three co-speakers and uh, my two co-editors and my fellow contributors to the book could all be here. The book will be out very soon um, by the end of this month or shortly thereafter. So um, for anyone uh, who wants, you can find it on the Roman and Littlefield website or on the uh, amazon.com um, and the, uh, as well as if you contact the Davis Center. So the, um, there are many ways to get a hold of it, but uh, I want to thank also Davis Center staff for having with it is Penny Skalnick and um, Danielle um, to, uh, that, that, uh, who were really crucial in setting up today's seminar. And with that, um, we will draw to a close. So thank you to the audience and thank you to my